Welcome to today's Grand Rounds. I'm Toral Surti, Assistant Professor in Psychiatry, and today have the pleasure and privilege of introducing our Grand Round speaker, Dr. Tanzim Chaudhry, who comes to us from computer science and technology to share her insights and her work with us to better inform how we think about research and uh, clinical care in psychiatry. Um, so I'm very glad she can join us. She is an associate professor in the Information Sciences Department at Cornell University and the director of the People Aware Computing Lab. As you will hear about today, her lab develops innovative tools to capture and understand human behavior, social interactions, and social networks in typical daily life. Dr. Chaudhry has a bachelor's degree from the University of Rochester in electrical engineering and a master's and a doctorate from the MIT Media Lab. Her master's thesis was the study of facial features for understanding expressions. Her graduate work in sensing and modeling social networks created a new field called reality mining. According to Wikipedia, reality mining is collecting and analyzing machine-sensed environmental data pertaining to human social behavior. MIT Technology Review called this field one of the 10 technologies most likely to change the way we live. Since, our, since her graduate studies, she's been inspired by the suffering associated with mental illness and had the insight that serious episodes of psychiatric instability can be predicted by quantifiable changes in behavior. She has founded the company Health Rhythms to use smartphones to collect behavioral data unobtrusively and provide more tools to everyone, patients and clinicians, about their behavior. After graduate school, she worked for Intel to innovate ways to help elderly people live more independently. She is also the director of graduate studies in her department. She's received numerous awards. I'll just mention a few here. Uh, she's been a Calvi Fellow from the National Science Foundation, has been a TED Fellow, and has received funding from men many places, including the National Science Foundation, the National Institutes of Mental Health, Google, and Intel. She was recognized as an outstanding innovator by MIT Technology Review in their 35 under 35 list. Their pervasive 10-year impact award from Ubicomp has been awarded to her, and her work has been featured in the Wall Street Journal and other places. Uh, Dr. Chaudhry thinks a great deal about how to get the best quality data with her background in engineering and computer science, but also how to do so in a respectful way that is sensitive to people's comfort and autonomy. So please, without further ado, join me in welcoming Dr. Chaudhry. Thank you, everyone. It's, uh, I'm very excited to be here. And I, I specifically asked uh, Troll to say that my clinical knowledge is this much. I learn from you all, and, but I'm very interested in understanding how technology can help in um, tracking um, indicators of, of health and ultimately be able to provide, also deliver intervention. And this title kind of is meant to be a, a bit of tongue in cheek, right? I, I think we're still a long way to go from making it like super easy and simple, but I want to kind of tell you about some of the work that we are doing in towards that goal of how can we really make this measurement um, not just accurate, but also easy to use and easy for the patients to um, uh, kind of accept and, and, and kind of utilize. So I want to start with kind of when I uh, started to learn more about mental health, um, I wanted to understand um, what, are, what are some of the tools that are being used, right? So um, when I was, I, I grew up in Bangladesh and then I came here for my um, studies and kind of had very little kind of exposure to recognize mental illness and even let alone um, how, how to treat it um, effectively and, and humanely. So the first kind of um, tools that I learned about which many of you probably use all the time is PHQ, right, PHQ-9. And, um, and also kind of understanding that um, really 
to diagnose someone with mental illness is you don't go and kind of uh, really there is a very little objective test, right? So, but if you kind of look at, um, I was thinking that if we're looking at some um, screening measure and asking people to um, self-report on, on a lot of their behavior, a lot of the things um, technology can help with, right? So uh, if you just take some of, some of the, the questions in, in PHQ, right? Little interest in pleasure of doing things. So what is someone doing the, um, and where are they going? And is that changing to feeling down and depressed? There are various uh, different indicators in terms of your movement and your speech, your devices usage can actually help um, uh, assess that. Sleep is another one just energy, eating, right, um, rates of doing things. So what was um, apparent is that there are a lot of um, things that are being assessed here where sensing and, and mobile technology, wearable technology, smartphone technology can really help. And the, the first step would to alleviate kind of the burden on a patient to self-report all the time. And also, um, oftentimes in, in some of our work, what we have seen is when someone is um, in, a, in a poor state or their mental health is declining, the quality of self-report goes down, right? So can you get more, um, uh, better coverage across different um, states of their mental health? Then we had also, um, uh, and I, I work closely with clinicians, and, and through that I've also had opportunities to interact with some patients to get a, a patients to get a better understanding about um, uh, the area, and and then again a lot of these behavioral kind of issues came up, right? So how how you walk, how you this was very like uh, my legs bound, speech goes fast, I even eat too fast. That was from patients suffering from mania, right? So things about um, how how much you sleep, when you sleep, when you wake up just how you walk, how you interact. These are the things that we can measure. And, and these are the things we can measure continuously so that you don't have to have just this sporadic input from the users. And also we can have um, a coverage across kind of their uh, mental health, uh, the, the states of their kind of when their mental health is fluctuating, right? So one of uh, uh, myself and 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 a lot of uh, my colleagues and researchers in the area in uh, kind of wearable computing ubiquitous computing have been working on actually building um, sensing uh, sensing systems new types of sensors as well as algorithm to detect a lot of these activities right activity sleep so one thing that was apparent I I highlighted phq9 but uh, when I've looked at various um, mental health questionnaires, a lot of these issues, like a lot of these uh, behavioral kind of uh, is important and comes up in many of them. There are other things that also come about, but just being able to track someone's daily kind of daily behavior, key behavior is, is important. And that's kind of what we've been working on trying to, uh, trying to solve. So of course, the now a lot of these kind of sensing is packaged into our cell phone, right? A cell phone can detect movement. It has accelerometer. It also has GPS. It knows where you are going. It um, has. It can just we have, and I'll talk about it. It has um, light and acoustic and others, which can be used to also look at sleep. Um, it uh, you do a lot of social activities, including phone call, SMS. So. Um, this is this is a really powerful device that also uh, people carry with them all the time, right? So now most most people will not leave their home without their phone, and and it's it's almost uh, almost like a, their uh, their additional kind of I don't know. Um, part of their body almost, right? This is people think about this is just like completely indisposable, and there are certain kind of wearables and um, you may hear this kind of buzzword called like IOT, like Internet of Things devices that are becoming more popular, right? Um, there are a bunch of wearables and then there are um, watches that people are using. I'm assuming, how many of you have an Alexa at home? 
so not as many as my CS colleagues. I'd like to see all the hands up. But still, um, it's, it's, it's get, uh, getting there. So there are, there are devices, and, and people are getting comfortable with that. That's one important thing, right? Alexa, people buy it, but it, it, it is always listening to you, right? People got really upset when there was, I think, one of the, the, the uh, TVs that had was um, also, um, especially was taking pictures. Or So there is also a fine line about what, uh, what this device can measure and what it's actually looking at locally, what it's sending to the cloud and how it's being used, and we need to be careful. But the, the main thing is that these devices also can understand your behavior, right? If you are um, uh, morning, like I, 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 uh, I was mentioning to Toral yesterday that the first kind of, the, the, the most routine use of Alexa is when I come down, make my coffee and set my coffee timer, we're using Alexa, right? But thing is that a lot of about your behavior and routines get captured by not only your phone, but other devices that are in the home. And this is only going to kind of grow. One thing that we need to be, uh, pay attention to is all these devices can capture data. Um, they are continuous, but what will happen is not um, the data quality and coverage will vary, right? And we need to um, think about um, it's not always that you want the high, you want to optimize for accuracy, right? Let's say I have a, a sensing system that is 70% uh, accurate, and should I just be working on pushing that accuracy up to 90, 95%, or should I work on, okay, this is, this is something that, uh, so microphone, let's take microphone for example, uh, but people might not want the microphone on, or should I be working on actually doing capturing of some acoustic events in a privacy sensitive way so that it's accepted by the user. I actually get coverage throughout the day or weeks, but I'm not getting as rich a stream in terms of if we want to talk about emotion, listening to the words would have been um, maybe more richer, but so there is always this trade-off. Oftentimes when we think about uh, a sensing and when media talks about sensing, it's like, okay, someone's listening to you or someone's watching you, but it's a continuous kind of spectrum. You can decide how you want to process this data in order to have a good balance between what your needs are, right? So if, if uh, right now self-reported measure is getting you um, 50 to 60% reliability, maybe 75 is an improvement if you can get coverage across all, throughout time, right? So I think one of the things that doesn't happen enough is that requires a discussion between um, those who, is, who are building technology with folks like you who are th understand the patients, understand your needs, and understand where the kind of um, challenges are and where the kind of current level of accuracy is to try to design solutions that will be useful to you, that will be adopted by patients, and that will actually improve what the quality of care that you're able to provide. So something that often uh, doesn't get um, done iteratively. I think it's very important to do that iteratively. Often technologies will build something and throw it toward you guys and you will be like, okay, this like no one's gonna use this, it's too cumbersome, I don't wanna look at all this data, and it doesn't get refined and tuned in the way it needs to be. So it's, it's really crucial to kind of think about not just a technology uh, solution that you can um, use, but a lot of things I think that will really make a difference will have to be co-designed and co-evolved by working and deploying with clinical um, clinicians and also, also patients. So um, I'm going to kind of now talk to, uh, mention a little bit about some of these behavior and then how we put together in, in understanding mental health. Um, some I'll go in somewhat more depth than others based on um, where things are in the technology side. So activity, physical activity, I won't really talk much about other than from a technology perspective, it's almost a, a, a solved problem, right? You can buy uh, wearables and bands and your phone. Both Google and iOS have a built-in kind of libraries that track whether you're stationary, walking, running, 
and, and a transportation. So from a research perspective, there is you can make improvement, but I would say that there isn't that much um, like breakthrough that's waiting to be, uh, happen, right? So this is something that it, we can get reliably um, from existing, even commercialized devices. So the next is kind of thinking about someone's mood and social behavior. And one of the areas that I've worked on quite a bit is, and one of the oldest sensors on phones is audio, right? So. Um, our voice carries a lot of signals, and I don't um, probably have to uh, kind of tell you that in terms of just when someone is having a kind of psychomotor retardation, just like slowing down of speech, um, uh, flattening of intonation, right, the speaking rate. So all these things about how someone is speaking is indicative also of, of their mental health. Um, and the question now is, uh, people might feel uncomfortable having your phone continuously assess your conversation. So it was important to think about how can you do it in a privacy sensitive way. So I'm going to um, just try to give a quick overview of thinking about how kind of speech synthesis works in a kind of from a, um, a kind of um, uh, EE kind of setting, uh, electrical engineering setting. So if you kind of think about a very simplistic model of like speech production, what happens? You have kind of um, vibrations um, uh, kind of of the vocal folds that you see here in response to airflow from your lungs. And that's why if you kind of hold your uh, kind of uh, feel yourself here when you are talking, you will feel the vibration. And then your kind of a vocal tract is shaping that airflow to generate phonemes and speech, right? Um, so now, if you kind of think about, um, so there is this source where you have periodic um, signal, and then the filter is shaping that signal to generate speech. So if you get rid of the shaping information, you are getting rid of information about the speech content, but you actually still are preserving information about when there is human voice present, how uh, and how, so you can get at someone's pitch, um, you can look at chunks uh, when someone is talking, uh, so you can get at rate information, you can get at loudness. So there is a lot of information that's still preserved that is indicative of, of can be indicative of health. So kind of coming back to the quote that I said that I even speak too fast. You can definitely pick up on changes in someone's speaking rate or even kind of how much variability that they have in intonation as over, over time. So this actually was kind of a trade-off, right? If we were able to look at words, you might even get more interesting um, signals, right? So for example, if someone's saying incoherent speech, right, or aspects of their, they're actually speaking English, but the words are jumbled up, uh, you could get some of that by uh, listening to more details about the speech, but no one's going to accept it, right? So there again is this trade-off that the technology allows you to get at the richness of the data, but what level of richness is gives you enough information that is useful at the same time acceptable to the patient. So we were able to use this kind of trade-off to actually successfully collect data from um, patients who have depression, patients who have bipolar disorder, patients who have um, schizophrenia. Our longest study was actually studying um, schizophrenia patients for over uh, for a, a whole year, where we were actually um, collecting data about um, the the. Uh, the speech, but in a privacy sensitive manner. And um, you can get kind of very um, interesting and simple measures um, that let's say a person, so the blue person is the person we are measuring, we can see that they're having, um, these are their conversation networks. They're, they're talking to different people and it's in that they're talking with people of different group size. The, the lines, uh, the length of the line is saying, are they having long interactions, multiple interactions versus short interaction? So if this person, this is a person, let's say their baseline, um, uh, kind of change and, and persist to something like this, you might think that something is going wrong, right? Like something is happening. And um, you, you will be able to pick that up early and you will be able to and, and see if this is just uh, it, 
anybody can have a bad day or a bad week, but if it persists, you can actually pick up on it. And one of the things we did, one of my kind of earliest collaborations in, in health was with older adults. Um, and it was a very kind of, uh, it was a small pilot study that started that we looked at kind of doing um, these physical and mental activity questionnaires for older adults and uh, looked at whether just the sensor data correlate. So what we saw is some very good correlation in terms of just even just speech, right? how, much, how much speech uh, 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 conversations does the per uh, participant either um, is in, in close proximity or participates in. So this was kind of encouraging because we thought that there, there is signal there that could be used in um, really trying to kind of track and potentially have the, uh, be able to um, detect changes early on. Um, and, and we continue to kind of, based on this, we continue to kind of work on um, adding more um, signals as well as um, using this for other, other kind of clinical population as well as, um, and also for longer period of time, which I'll, I'll present later. Um, another thing that you can actually get at is um, look at stress, um, presence of stress in human voice, people's voice change when they're stressed. Um, this is more challenging, I would say, right now, because there is a lot of um, hum detecting human speech. Um, you can build a model that works across the board. Um, and then what you're saying is that how is my speech patterns changing over time? But how I, I uh, how my phone or a computer could recognize speech, I could just have one single uh, algorithm or a model that will work. But with stress, there is a lot of variability in how people express stress that um, building kind of a one size fits all doesn't work. And then you have to make, uh, have to adapt that to using data from that specific person, which is fine from kind of a, a kind of machine learning and kind of algorithmic point of view. But the challenge is that uh, if you are actually deploying it in a clinical population, then asking them to give you some data where you can improve your model might be more challenging. So what's the right way to achieve kind of um, uh, enough accuracy that is useful is something that's still, uh, there are possible ways of um, uh, tackling that, but I think that's still an unsolved problem. So the other thing that we have been, um, I'm kind of been fascinated somewhat with the ability to use kind of acoustics and sounds in as a signal for uh, for health and in and getting that right trade off. So the, another thing that we looked at. So my group does a combination of using sensors on the phone, but also thinking about what what new types of sensors do we need to build that will um, that will help in better tracking of behavior and also a lot of the sensors that are currently packaged on the phone have been inspired by some of the previous research from 10, 15 years ago that looked at activity recognition and all those kind of things. So what should the future generation of technology look like? So we do this one um, uh, kind of system, what we call a body beat. The idea was to um, listen, can you use uh, microphones to listen um, internally to your body? And it's kind of somewhat inspired by um, what doctors do, right? Auscultation, right? You use a stethoscope to listen to um, uh, sounds in different parts of the, the, the body. Um, and can we build a sensor that can do that continuously uh, and measure certain um, signals of the body? So what we did is we built kind of this microphone where um, uh, you can see this. This is kind of the, the sensor, and I know I'm, uh, can you still hear me? Um, so this is where we have this kind of membrane that touches the skin which is designed to actually have a, a match in acoustic impedance so that you get more signal kind of transference that uh, coming from internally from your body. And then there is this kind of silicon plastic around it that is trying to mask out all the external sounds. So here, this microphone is just listening to inside of your body and trying to filter out as much of external sound as it can. And the goal was to see what can we listen internally. 
oops, um, I, oh, this is the video. So one of the things that, let's see, I haven't, did I plug in? Um, when taking long, deep breaths, you'll notice a high intensity in the breathing okay, while the rate remains low. Okay. So we looked at breathing. Um, so you can see that this microphone that's around the kind of uh, throat is looking um, breathing rate. Can you listen to that? It's like, let's see if I can turn up the volume. Oh, there we go. So that this kind of gives you a picture that just um, using this, we could look at kind of breathing rate. We've looked at um, other sounds as well. And the, the thing here to notice is this, um, it also works in very noisy environment. If there are sounds around you and um, if you're w walking indoors, outdoors, uh, you cannot capture like breathing from a cell phone microphone, right? You can. So the goal, our goal is, this is also an early research prototype. Can you embed that in your um, headphones or something like that that will actually, uh, I'll, I'll pass that, um, uh, that will uh, be able to kind of unobtrusively capture some of the signals internally. So some of the other things that we've looked at also capturing with this type of microphone. So this is the kind of prototype. And this will never, this is a research prototype, right? So in order to like really make it kind of work, it needs to be much, uh, there is a lot more like design and embedded systems design that needs to go into it. But um, what what can you capture with it? So these are some of the body sounds that we looked at, right? Just eating behavior. So eating is, um, I would say, an unsolved problem from a sensing perspective, right? There is really no good sensor that tracks eating. Now, um, what are the intermediate steps? If we are able to look at eating moments, if we are able to look at eating durations, would that be useful, right? So this is kind of um, something that we looked at. Um, and then there are things like coughing sound, breathing sound, deep breathing, right? So there are certain signals that you can get. And because we designed it, so there is uh, not all is kind of algorithmic. Some of it's actually how you design the system. We designed it to really explicitly filter out external kind of sounds. So when you, so if you're not kind of familiar, each of these kind of um, figures that you're seeing is a spectrogram, which is showing over time how the frequency changes. So the y-axis is frequency, x-axis is time. And because we are filtering out uh, external sound, these signals look fairly clean. So from a recognition point of view, it makes our task a lot easier. So there again, you want to actually get at the signal and try to filter out as much uh, sound. One of my students was actually working on, can you put like a belt version of that where you can get an abdominal sound? So that's why it's, uh, it's there. We, we really haven't worked on that that much yet. So, um, and it, it was inspired by all the different ways doctors use stethoscope, right? So there are, there are um, kind of, I think, more work needs to be done here, but it's encouraging kind of to, like how you can actually design devices that can capture some of the signal as you go about your kind of daily life. And I mentioned kind of eating is a ch uh, kind of a challenging problem. There's some kind of simple solution that people have tried, including us, and there's been folks at Harvard and others. They'll just actually ask people to take a picture and send it to the web where the crowd labels the food and you get an estimate of calorie content, right? So um, using, people use an Amazon, if you're familiar with Amazon Mechanical Turk, but it's basically there are volunteers who get paid pennies um, so they're not technically volunteers, but almost, um, that will do certain micro tasks. So this is something that people have, people have looked, looked at as well. One of the things that is in very early stages, I would say, technology research, and my um, uh, nowhere close to be kind of deployed at a large scale is, is a plate that we built. So we built this plate. It has sensors inside that um, sense color, and also it can change color. So I'll show you a video. Let's see. 
Oh, it's not working. All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll kind of explain. So if you put a certain um, color of food, it actually can change the color of the plate as well. So first is that can we just look at the color distribution of the food? That doesn't tell you something about calorie or the healthiness, but just as a starting point of trying to understand. But where the, the other thing, when it changes the color, we actually try to change um, the perception of the quantity of food that there is on the plate. So that if you kind of, um, if you match the color, the people think that there is more food on the plate than there actually is, and if there is a contrast. So one of the goal, and I'll come back to the end, is how do we influence behavior? So if we can measure their behavior, are there way where we can influence their, their perception or provide the nudges to get them to behave in certain way? So eating is one example. Oh, um, I can try to find the video later on and show it to you if you're interested. So that's, that's kind of, there are ways of kind of getting at um, you know, useful signals without actually solving the problem completely. There's another thing that we are currently working on, it's almost like just we submitted a paper on this, is on um, sensing alcohol using a wrist, uh, which I thought there might be folks interested. So there is a kind of um, using uh, by impedance measure and like uh, near infrared um, sensors in a wristwatch type um, setting to look at um, alcohol concentration. Um, so this is, we've gotten some promising results. Obviously we haven't really widely tested it, but looking at um, just based on the kind of uh, wavelength and reflectance, you can get um, um, a sense of alcohol concentration. So then again, if you can embed it in kind of watches or smart watches, you can or potentially be, it might be very useful in, in the future in, in tracking like substance abuse and kind of um, so this again, what are beyond alcohol and others like what's the, the, the possibility of using this kind of device we're still kind of exploring, but something that we've been recently started to look at. Another area which uh, where many of you I think know is important is sleep. So I'll tell you about um, there are already existing solutions that are based on self-report or wearing kind of um, wrist uh, bands, which is useful in, in collecting sleep. And I'll give you some a different type of approach that we have been taking. So what, what we have noticed that people don't like to um, wear wristbands and they're not good at self-reporting. So can we actually have a contactless me uh, mechanism for detecting sleep? So we built this system called Doppel Sleep, which actually uses a kind of Doppler radar, short range Doppler radar, to get at, um, look at a person's heart rate, breathing rate, and movement to estimate sleep when someone falls asleep. So just to give a quick intro into how kind of, uh, kind of uh, Doppel Sleep works, right? You have kind of, a, as, a, as I said, like a, um, a Doppler radar that's kind of in a bedside device that's facing the user. Right, and the body kind of lies within kind of the the, the, the range of, of the the radar, and then it transmits kind of 24 gigahertz electromagnetic wave, and the advantage of that is that it actually can go through kind of blankets and clothing, so and and it, so you actually can still capture useful signal, and then for them it looks like kind of you it's inside the body, your breathing is happening, heart, uh, heart is beating, so the kind of electromagnetic wave is seeing something like this, and then it kind of gets reflected, right? And um, if the body doesn't move, what will happen is um, there will be two particular kind of vibration, heartbeat and breathing, and the reflected wave will capture that kind of information um, so that um, we can use the kind of, I won't go into the detail, like the phase modulated signal to actually figure out, um, extract out the respiration, like the breathing rate and the heart rate, and then you can filter those out. You can also look at movement 
and based on, uh, on that, the combination, what we can do is we can uh, figure out when someone went to bed, when they fell asleep because of the heart rate um, and breathing rate changes. So we can estimate, and if they have wo woken up um, in the middle of, uh, of the middle of the night, so we can compute uh, measure called like, which some of you uh, probably used, called sleep efficiency, as well as sleep interruptions from um, this kind of uh, bedtime device. This is now uh, with some of our colleagues at University of Washington, we are um, uh, doing a comparison using in a sleep clinic using polysomnography. Um, which, which will give us a little bit more. Um, what we have shown that we can get it, there are also, you can buy these sensing vests that it, we can measure things accurately, but we are also doing it in, um, in a kind of a sleep clinic to see how it compares with something like polysomnography. Uh, the time, okay, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip the video and we can come back to it if, if there is more time. Um, also, just um, for actually younger user and active phone user, just using kind of phone usage, we, you can also estimate sleep. People often go to, uh, like put the phone right by their bed when they sleep. Uh, with the student population, we have about, about 100, uh, uh, more than 100 days of data where we collected with student population. Um, they, when they wake up, they use their phone. If they're interrupted in their sleep, they, they use their phone. If they're going to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night, they use their phone, right? So one of the things is that uh, you can actually estimate how much a person sleep just based on phone usage. And one of the things that um, we have done also is just what type of um, applications they're using when they go to bed versus when they wake up. We could also look, get information about their uh, body clock and chronotype, right? Just so, for example, someone who, who is a, um, a late type person, if they wake up early because they have to go to class, they'll like get up and kind of be like groggy and they might just like look at, uh, I don't know, their Instagram feed and Twitter feed and not really do anything cognitively demanding versus if you're up and about, you might actually start actually writing coherent emails and do much more kind of work related apps. So just just whether someone is, and this kind of, when you're just browsing things is referred to as like cyber slacking, right? So when you're doing like kind of cyber slacking, that, 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 all these information can actually help you to figure out the person's chronotype. So just by using, uh, and we use the immune chronotype uh, questionnaire to kind of benchmark, just using phone usage for at least active phone user, we could get at sleep, sleep interruptions as well as chronotype. And we could all, uh, yeah, so, that, that was kind of interesting in terms of that you might, for certain population, you might not even need very sophisticated sensing to get uh, good quality sleep information. So um, I talked a lot about measurement, right? And I want to kind of switch gears and to tell you a little bit about what we have done with it, right? And I, I like this picture because it kind of shows that so on the technology side, we spend a lot of time trying to figure out sensors and measuring and really try to get at uh, m measuring everything we can, but we're not just kind of a collection of numbers. And one of the things I've realized working with um, clinical folks that you don't want to see just numbers either, right? So when we say that, oh, you have all this data and like, what can you do? And one of the responses is like, get this away from me because uh, I already have too much stuff on my plate to like try to now understand all this data. So one of the things that's crucial from, from a technology perspective that we need to move beyond quantification to action. How can we help you take better actions and patients take better actions? So I'm gonna start with like some um, uh, smaller um, studies that we have done to some larger studies as well. So the very first uh, one was a case study called uh, Mood Rhythm. This was collaboration with um, um, a researcher who, a prominent researcher in bipolar disorder, many of you might know, Ellen Frank, uh, who was at University of Pittsburgh. And what she used to do is kind of use the interpersonal social rhythm therapy and use a questionnaire that's called SRM5, social rhythm metric, which is um, where asking different activities when someone goes to bed, the first contact, when they leave for work, school, or family care, dinner, and bed. 
and also recording your mood um, over over time. And the idea, uh, what she would uh, want to do is kind of see what behaviors and changes, disruption affects their mood, and then also try to regulate their um, routines, right? So the um, from from the work she has done shows that that disruptions in routine and kind of particularly kind of circadian like misalignment leads to um, um, exacerbation in uh, kind of symptoms and what what a lot of her work had looked at is to kind of give um, patients a, a routine that can and some of her work showed that it actually leads to longer stable periods so what we wanted to do with her was all these things like yeah, you can move this paper survey to a smartphone survey, but still people don't fill it out all the time. And if you're asking them five times a day when they're in a depressive episode, they probably won't do it. Can we use our sensors to automatically? So from this, you would actually have a social rhythm um, score, which is used to assess whether the person is stable or not stable or within between zero to seven. We actually try to infer these scores automatically just using sensors. So what we would give, so uh, kind of thinking about, instead of bombarding Ellen with data, uh, what we would actually do is this is this person's SRM score, the same thing she would get from a patient, but now it's generated by the patient's phone. And what we saw that actually we can do a pretty good job of um, looking at, so if you look at the kind of mean error, it's about uh, less than a point. And if we just want to like do a kind of a binary decision of stability and stability status, um, we get fairly good um, accuracy, at least good enough and better than what she can get just based on self-reported measure. So this, this basically allowed the system, like so now, that the opportunity of, of a clinician just to get this SRM score more continuously, that is being assessed more continuously, and it's not asking you to l learn how to read accelerometer data or all these data traces, but it's summarizing in a way that you already use. So that's kind of something that we've been working on of how do we actually aggregate that data in a way that is, uh, that is actionable for um, those making clinical decisions. And then there is the opportunity, what Ellen would do also, that based on this, she would actually design interventions that would work um, for her patients. So we can also think about doing behavior-triggered intervention on a person's phone. So this is like the simplest thing that we have kind of done. Here, this is kind of what the system looks like. It's looking at um, different days, how they're doing. So um, it, because there are targets of having uh, these behavior at certain times, going to sleep at certain times, waking up at certain times, whether you are on target or you are off target or marginal. And, and then there is this weekly feedback where you can see green, you're okay, orange, you're not doing that well, and marginal and steep, you're really struggling, and then deliver some of these kind of modules she would deliver to the patient, but it's automatically being triggered by what we measured, where their what behavior is kind of leading to this lower score, and, and then um, delivering that intervention. So it's a, it's a way where we can also connect the measurement to the intervention and trigger it um, on a need base by, by the behaviors that we are observing. Another study that we did, um, we just finished kind of all the data collection. It was, which I mentioned, with patients with schizophrenia, where we actually had, um, it was a, a clinical trial where we had 150 patients, 75 using our kind of smartphone arm of detecting mental health changes in individuals with schizophrenia. And our goal there was similar. When we first kind of went, we said, oh, look at all the data that we can show you. And, and we got a lot of pushback of not to bombard them with data. So we looked at kind of two things. And I can go into more detail later on if you're interested. One is um, how they would ask the patients is to do some self-reported um, 
um, kind of uh, measures that would happen on a, a weekly basis of like looking at um, kind of positive and negative symptoms. So these would some of the questions uh, that I think the, uh, the patients had to fill out three times a week uh, would, where we wanted to see if we can actually use sensor traces to um, look at, um, estimate these um, EMA score automatically. So here kind of you can see um, how well we do. So the raw score is what the patient self-reported measure is over time. And the red line is what we are what we are um, uh, predicting, and then you can do different level of smoothing over time to try to get like a more stable signal, right? Less fluctuation. So you can see it's it's tracking the EMA very well, and uh, kind of from a clinical perspective, one of the feedback we get, it might be even a a, a better representation because patient self-report is um, there is a lot of kind of bias based on what just happened, like last hour, right? There is the kind of biases that might result in a lot of these jitters or fluctuation that might get smoothed out by kind of trying to predict it using kind of the continuous um, sensor trace that we have. We actually went one step further where the, the, the trial included um, an intervention piece where we would um, try to use our sensor signal to um, predict this um, uh, VPRS score. So. Uh, I'm always so bad with name. It's behavioral psych. Yes, yeah, beef psychiatric rating scale, and um, where how it was designed is we would collect the data, use the data from the last month, compute the the BPRS score. If it was, I think the 12 was the cutoff point. If it was greater than 12, the uh, the case manager would know, and then the case manager would decide either to directly reach out to the patient or notify the, the clinician and treatment. Again, one of the design is how do you make this very um, accessible and useful for the clinician? Maybe you don't want the patient's phones buzzing uh, like the, the clinician's phone all the time. That, so there is a way of like how do you, we are trying to get at a score that this case manager would understand and then would, they would already know in terms of the, how they operate, how to act on it, and then only engage the clinician if it's needed. And this is kind of an example. So we actually had about 116 kind of instances in, so far, like this was slightly before the data collection finished, um, with different scores, right, between 1 to 36. Um, and so the left uh, is showing the number of axes. It's a bit hard to understand. So the blue bar graph, you should look at the left axis number of how many BPRS kind of uh, measures did we have. And the right axis is showing how much there was and kind of error in our kind of prediction. So you can see it's kind of between plus two and minus four. Um, there is more error in the higher rating because we had fewer measurements as well. But generally you can see that of a measure of uh, um, kind of one to 36, kind of how the error looks like. So the red is the mean error, which you should use the right axis. So we're, we were trying to pack in a lot of information there. But generally, we were able to kind of um, predict with uh, reasonable accuracy for, for the, the clinicians uh, to act on that. And now we are actually analyzing a lot of, lot of the data of to see did it make a difference between those who were in the um, control arm versus the experiment arm. So ultimately, what we actually need to do is um, be able to uh, measure, understand, and then influence the behavior, right, doing a feedback. Um, I will actually um, quickly go through the next one. So one was another aspect of how do we personalize that intervention. One way to kind of think about it, let's say something like physical activity, simple, something like physical activity. Um, and we are looking at where they're stationary, where they're walking, the paths that they take, whether they're going to um, the gym. We can use that to actually generate, as I said, behavior triggered suggestions. So in a physical activity realm, you can actually use what they do to say, you've actually walked near this location this many times as a suggestion 
what you, where you can walk, right? Like right now, you would have goals of, oh, you're supposed to take 10,000 steps, you've taken 5,000, go figure out how you're gonna figure out the rest. This is actually using your data when you, when you do certain activities and behavior, where you do and how you do it, to actually give you suggestions that will be much more fit into your lifestyle and routine and is more actionable. So it's kind of taking the notion of self-efficacy. I've done it so many times, you have more notion that you can do it. And the other thing is, it's highly personalized. It's based on your routine, based on the behaviors that you do. So what we have kind of looked at is just like encouraging little things. Continue walking where you have done, like avoid like really bad food. And it's done all automatically. The system tracks it, it looks at your behavior, and it looks at the frequency of your behavior. So it's not just like, so if, you're, if you have a weight loss goal, it wouldn't be just like calorie expenditure. It's, um, you might expend a lot of calories you going to the gym, but you never go to the gym, or you go to the gym once a month, versus if you actually walk uh, to office um, three times a week, actually boosting that might gain you more in terms of kind of in trying to get you towards your kind of physical goal than actually encouraging you to go to the gym. And it can actually generate difference using the same algorithm based on their behavior, very different personalized, like customized personalized suggestion for different individuals. And what we have seen like in a 16 week kind of study that we actually increased the number of uh, physical activity and reduced in terms of like um, calorie consumption in terms of food. And there that was more focused on like looking at kind of weight loss population, which it meant like it wasn't like a drastic kind of weight loss, but it was something that sustained and people found um, easy to use that they were kind of losing, losing weight. But it was that trade off of trying to make very kind of personalized and very kind of adaptive that fits into that person's lifestyle. So I think as we think about intervention, it's really crucial to think not just about intervention that optimizes kind of one metric of like weight goals, but kind of use sensing and technology to understand what are the right opportunities to nudge the users in a way that might be in the long term be sustainable. Which kind of will bring me to, towards the, the last topic, which probably to many of you will seem very wacky and it's very kind of uh, um, work in progress, the, the latest thing that we are doing, um, which I'm actually very excited about. And if you have ideas or thoughts, I would love to hear um, how you think that um, some, of, some of the idea can work. So if you think about, um, patient's reported behavior or self-reported measure, right? You had paper, and then a lot of it's still used that you use ecological momentary assessment on the phone. Some of the work that we are trying to do is how do you make that invisible? You can measure people's behavior in the background using their phone and the sensors without burdening the user. But if you think about intervention, um, it's, it requires active engagement, often requires a lot of motivation, um, and a um, lot of effort and often fails. And from a technology design intervention, I think our, uh, we haven't done very well. Partly, I think, why we haven't done very well is because we require a lot of um, motivation or effort from the user. So can we actually think about intervention in the same way as we thought about measurement? Can we take from more active to making intervention almost invisible. It won't work in all the cases, right? Sometimes knowing what you're doing and reflection is very important, but it could work in some cases, right? So can we actually make it an explicit to something just is more peripheral and maybe even kind of subliminal? And I'm gonna give you some examples of what we've done, right? Can we design technologies that do not require our conscious awareness? Um, to be effective. And I was kind of, this is a uh, kind of work has been inspired by some of the work in behavioral economics and also work done by um, um, uh, Daniel Kahneman and others also the, the very recent like uh, recipient of like economics Nobel Prize who looked at the theory of nudge is how do you, like our, um, our brain like instinctively we react to certain things and then what, um, Kahneman calls system one, right? You're kind of instinctively reacting. And then there is system two where you're actually thinking about it and, and taking action. But if we think about technology, 
most of it's built on system two, where it requires you to actively think and make a conscious decision. Um, but then it relies on the user's motivation, right? And um, some people are uh, good at that and others. And, um, but they have to attend to it. Sometimes actually um, act giving people feedback in certain circumstances could be even disruptive, right? So for example, this is a very uh, a, a funny cartoon and I don't know, it's called the centipede effect, right? If you have, tell a centipede this in this poem that um, the, the frog is telling the centipede to like, I think, uh, look at, I forgot. Oh, yeah, which leg moves after which, right? And then the centipede is so overwhelmed by trying to track the, the hundreds of legs that it becomes paralyzed, right? So if we now burden the user with understanding, tracking, and reflecting on so much, we might actually paralyze ourselves. And certain times, let's say I'm having a panic attack, asking me to do mindfulness exercises in certain situations is not going to work, right? So how do we, how do we think about times where we might need intervention to do it in a way that does not take away our attention and, and require a lot of effort. So I'll give you a couple of examples. One is the system what we called emotion check. Um, it was uh, uh, done to real time regulate your anxiety. So we brought in a bunch of people. So this is a wristband, it's a wearable, again a research prototype, which just um, can vibrate at a certain rate um, in response to your heart rate. We brought in a bunch of people, asked them to, uh, we did a trier stress test, to induce stress, and then used this to give them um, what we said, like feedback on their heart rate. We said that this will give you feedback on your heart rate. So for a group of people, if their heart rate is racing, going up, this would vibrate at, at the same rate, like 110 beats per minute, which equates to 1.8 hertz. For some, we actually made it um, gave them false feedback at 60 beats per minute. And others, it was just a kind of uh, just random vibration. Um, what we saw is the group, which is in green, that got um, false heart rate feedback, their anxiety level didn't change. So basically, we actually actively gave them false feedback for them to kind of this, almost like the, um, to, to, to think they weren't, uh, like their heart, was more kind of stable than uh, others. So this is actually something we were very encouraged by and we are actually deploying it with uh, some of the student population with the, um, our student health center and we particularly want to look at um, patients, uh, like students who are more, um, have anxiety um, issues and um, to see if it really kind of um, extend into kind of real daily life situation. The next even wackier thing that we did was um, think about, we know that um, is it possible to change emotion by changing our behavioral expression? This is known in psychology already, right? People talk about facial feedback hypothesis. This is like a famous experiment um, there where people were asked to rate a comedy after holding the pencil like in a frowny versus smile. And actually those who were holding it in a smiley face actually rated the comedy as funnier. So just, um, so we wanted to kind of uh, play around with that. Um, is it possible to kind of self-perception of behavioral expression? We started um, looking, trying to, and uh, we did get IRB approval of trying to get uh, induced conflicts in couples. Um, and oftentimes, so one of my colleagues who have looked at kind of uh, videos of marital counseling, often what comes, it's not what you said, it's how you said it. So we wanted to manipulate how someone um, sounds during conflict. So what we did is wanted to increase like the, the warmth or calmness in a voice. And so as this experiment was done, we had about, um, uh, I think, 29 couples, so 58 um, individuals, where um, they were at least together for six months, and there was a kind of a standard questionnaire that is used to assess what are some of the, the topics of con uh, conflict, and then you ask them to talk about it and see if, if they actually get into an argument. And um, then what happened was 
the person, one of the air person would hear the partner's voice more changed, so modulated to make them sound uh, calmer and warmer. Um, so can you actually uh, manage? One of the things what we saw, so there were like four conditions, right? Uh, where you had feedback and no feedback um, in, in a normal case, right? Where they actually got, um, and in a manipulation case where we were ma manipulating the voice. What we saw when you manipulate the voice with feedback, you actually see kind of, a change in anxiety. And also we looked at heart rate variability, which we saw changes in heart rate variability. So this was kind of exciting. Um, one other thing we also saw that partners know each other, whether they perceive it. So we tried to do very subtle changes, whether they actually perceive like, oh, this person didn't sound like the person because you know your partner well. Um, so we've been kind of encouraged by, and then there is also a lot of ethical issues in terms of whether you want to do this, but uh, maybe if a couple who are going to therapy interested in working on that, they might agree to something like that that allows the things not to escalate, right? It, it kind of brings things down where people can talk about it. So I think it's not okay in, without explicit permission or explicit uh, adoption, but we wanted to see whether you can actually make an effect here, right? So that's, that's kind of some of the latest work that we've been kind of doing in, in the idea of how do you take all these signals and what are the different ways you can intervene, right? Of course we can gamify things, of course we can give you feedback, but are there other things in terms of how the brain works, how, from what we know from psychology, social psychology, that can influence the design of technology, which is something that I'm really fascinated by. So with that, I wanna kind of wrap up and I wanna kind of say what, what is, in the behind and inspiration of what a lot of what we do is actually this kind of quote by Mark Weiser, who is known to be like the founder of Ubicomp or and regarded as, is that uh, he says that technology can disappear. And once it does, that is when it's truly valuable because, because that's when we stop worrying about the technology itself, but about what it actually does. So I think in the context of health and well-being, if a technology just is overburdened, um, the clinician, the patient, it's not gonna do what it needs to do. And it really needs to kind of uh, be almost invisible to you so that you can do what you need to do, but it can only augment what you're able to do. So thank you very much. And I wanna, um, a lot of the work uh, wouldn't be possible without my collaborators and uh, members of my group and, and people who fund this work. So thank you.